This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Happy New Year. It's time to take out the trash with three of Broadway's top critics reviewing the new shows. Here to introduce them, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And we're joined tonight by Linda Weiner of Newsday. Welcome back to Theater Talk, Linda. Jacques Lesourd of Gannett Newspapers. Down here from Westchester, Jacques. Welcome. Way up there. <laughs> and our old friend John Simon of Bloomberg.com. Bloomberg News. Bloombergnews.com. Welcome to Theater Talk. Uh, before we get into uh, 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 slicing and dicing the season, I have to ask you guys, the tables were turned on you recently in Time Out, <laughs> where they ranked the critics. Now, um, I wonder, uh, are you guys um, uh, thin skin? Can you take the criticism that was leveled at you, John? Well, I was number five, <laughs> which did very well for Chanel. So I thought it might be all right for me, too. <laughs> out of how many critics were you? Because I was left out altogether. Oh, I'm no. deeply, They're deeply. doing the, the Westchester edition of Time Out is out next week. When well, they'll then be I'll be number you. one, two, three, and, and five. That's it was great. out of ten, I believe, right? It was more than ten, actually. It was more than ten. And where was were you on ten? this ranking, Linda? I really don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but I can tell you that my husband, my dear husband, did who is number six on the music critics, um, <laughs> he did say to me, my darling, I want you to know that to me, you'll always be number five. <laughs> <laughs> Supportive spot. Yeah. The, the, just the larger point, though, you guys dish it out all the time. Absolutely. You, you, know, you ruin careers, you ruin lives, you destroy people's bank accounts. Um, <laughs> you have to be able to take it, right? Are you, are you thick-skinned about it, or does the criticism against you ever oh, no, prickle I, a little I bit? I have always advocated thick skin and deplored thin skin. But I could never find much thick skin among my colleagues. They were very thin skinned, most of them. Really? Mm. Do you find when that? you attacked us? <laughs> no, when, when, when they were just being what they were being. <laughs> Morons. You, no, of course. <laughs> That's right. You know, of course, we dish it out. We're absolutely fair game. Yeah. It would be nice if it had said something logical about one or two of me. Um, <laughs> basically, basically, they said I was a cheerleader. And a cranky burnout. And a he, cranky burnout? Cranky burnout. Yeah. Cranky burnout and cheerleader. So I thought, it's because I'm the only woman, and you know, we're moody. I think they did it like Zagat's, where they picked quotes yeah, out, yeah. and the quotes didn't connect with each other. And no, they, they don't. took the most negative quotes and put them in. But I no think sense. there should be a comic step whose hero is called Cranky Burnout. Cranky burnout. burnout. Well, I think you guys are all sports about it. Um, speaking of cranky burnout. Speaking of cranky burnout. <laughs> yes, let's, uh, let's talk about let's Mary start, Poppins. Let's start, <laughs> let's start cranking and burning things down. Now, the biggest show of the season is um, Mary Poppins, a $15, $20 million Disney musical. Um, were you a fan of the P.L. Travers books, Linda? Oh, absolutely. Knew nothing about them at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was, I was reading Nancy Drew. Ah, I see, I see. A fan of the movie, though, right? The classic Disney movie, Mary Poppins. Uh, well enough. And how does this musical uh, uh, hold up? Well, you know, what are we comparing it to? Are we comparing it to the books in the movie, or are we comparing it to the best that that Broadway could do? Well, if, that, because I think that you know it, it's utterly conventional, ex with some weirdnesses and later and and fine she flies and they tell a story and and um, I didn't really care and it wasn't at all like like the Lion King for example where mm -hmm. I think they actually took a talent that Julie Taymor and gave her free reign and created something new yeah. this is kids theater yeah. Jacques, but you took least, a kid. Well, I, I took a kid who liked the show, and let's face it, it's a brand name. I mean, we can talk about shows as brand names. Mary Poppins is a brand, and everybody loves it to begin with. Now, I like the, 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 the certain faithfulness to the book, the several books, but the main book, because Mary Poppins was not a, a, a smiley, cheerful, adorable, charming person. She's always telling the kids to shut up, be quiet, <laughs> you get in line. And this, this uh, Mary Poppins was somewhat, she smiled a little bit at the beginning, which I didn't approve of, but she was pretty <laughs> stern with the kids, which I, I, I liked. I mean, I think they did go back to the books uh, much better than the movie. Yes, uh, but if they'd I, gone to the book, they would have had a character woman be Mary Poppins and not some, some leading lady type. 
Which I think she's a great asking, leading lady type. A uh, Julie has, Andrews type, which broke with the, with the book also. But she has the important gift, uh, Susan, that she can be replaced with no pain. Well, yeah. so, that's right. Forever. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Bring We're not talking Susan about our here, you know, Susan. We keep saying she. I keep her saying. Saying. What is her, her name? name is Ashley what? Brown. This is not no art. This is just a but, big machine with lots of parts what, that need to be replaced. Exactly. It's it's just replaceable parts. Any humanity in this show, John? Mary Poppins. Humanity. I don't think humanity is something that you get from musicals. <laughs> you get something else. Oh, no, I just disagree. You do? Well, all right, but. Well, I quickly, because in the cradle I did not read Mary Poppins, I read Proust. So I had to do some, I had to do some very quick reading. And I liked what I read well enough, but as has been said, it was a little too sweet and Disney ish. But when somebody goes climbing up the perceivable arch, my heart goes out. Oh, that guy was great. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gavin Dancing Lee. Dancing on the ceiling like yeah. Dancing on the stairs. ceiling. That was yeah. wonderful. But how about the other dancing? How about, how about taking the children to the park where the, the, statues where the statues in loincloths come out. <laughs> well, they and couldn't have cartoon characters there. No, but I, that, the I, 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 I think Linda makes a point. What on earth what was that was choice this about? about? Well, that was about Matthew Bourne, who I think is one of the most annoying choreographers. Isn't he? Yes. Yeah, but don't forget, <laughs> part of the audience is gay for theater, and you've got to have nude well, statues. Well, part, part of the audience 12 is theater. Years. You know, the gay <laughs> audience has plenty of stuff yeah. to go to, <laughs> yeah. but not, not Mary Poppins, and, and yeah. I just don't know why they needed a dance of the hunky male nudes yeah. well, well, and male, female nudes. Yeah. Spe speaking of speaking of the the, the gay audience, <laughs> uh, there is a revival of Company, it's a Stephen Sondheim's musical that the gay audience, I'm sure, has flocked to. Um, what did you feel? What did you think about this revival, John? Well, from a gay point of view, <laughs> it can't hold a candle to Douglas Carter Bean. Or to certain other things, gray gardens and so on. It's not. Oh, let's say it. It's the best production in Cincinnati of the year. <laughs> I think that is just, it's the company to end Cincinnati theater. Which is the theater came to us from. Yeah, yeah. I the think John Doyle should be strung up by his thumb. The director. Why? Because that's all he has. He doesn't have any other kind of finger. By the mus <clears throat> musician's union, probably. Really. By whatever union, I don't care, as long as he's strung up. I think once one can get away with that kind of nonsense of the um, performers. As he did in Sweeney Todd, where yeah. the performers play instruments. And even then, it was only good if it was a novelty. We weren't used to it. It was different. We were sort of gaping mouthed about it. And he did that in Liverpool, where he didn't have any money. But yeah. New York producers yeah, right. love this. They <laughs> love John Doyle because it's cheap. You can make the actors carry their own instruments. <laughs> Linda, can you defend this production? I can defend it more. I mean, I think, first of all, I think the stakes were much lower than taking on Sweeney Todd like that, which I thought was brilliant. I really loved Sweeney Todd. Yeah, I agree with you. I it was and I think with company, company never works. Company has, <laughs> hey, right. company is a series of absolutely wonderful songs, each one a four-minute play mm -hmm. in itself. And I've never sat through company when I wasn't thinking, okay, would you shut up and sing? You know? Mm -hmm. And I think instead of shutting up, you know, instead of talking all the time, they walk around with musical instruments. So at least, it, you know, it keeps it a little bit more alive. <laughs> I don't hate this production at all. I rather like it. Um, but again, I'm saying that, it, you know, I think it's the best production of company I've ever seen outside of Cincinnati. But then again, <laughs> I didn't see the original. I was, um, I was in, in the cradle well, reading well, in <laughs> I was, I was still reading Nancy speaking Joe. Speaking as one who did see the original, yeah. as I imagine you did too, mm. John Simon, that was a, a extremely moving uh, musical. And, and those little plays worked together. Plus, you had the likes of Elaine Stritch you know, and blowing you had, the roof and off. You had but then, yes, of course. And oh, it yeah, was, nice. and to, it, to me, it so diminished any kind of dramatic uh, uh, momentum by having these people march around carrying cellos in circles. That uh, and there was no was party. A, there was not even. Bad. It's, it's bad. a very New York show, and mm -hmm. the moment mm -hmm. you make it abstract, it ceases to be it's New York. Very un New York. It's nowhere. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the actors are really very mediocre in general. With one or two exceptions. Raul Esparza? We like Raul Esparza. Why are you making a face about Raul Esparza? He doesn't like Raul I don't Esparza. like Well, Raul. why not? <laughs> I How can one not like him? He's, kind of, he's not great. He's, and the, the <laughs> singing of that last song. Being Alive. Being Alive. 
he sings with a rage. Of course, on, in a Broadway show, you have to scream. But he's screaming with a, a, rain, a rage that, that there's no excuse for. It's supposed to be a very bittersweet it's a sellout song. And well, it's doing it's like a an 11 song. Like Ethel, Ethel, Ethel Merman up yes. there. He's huh? having his Raul Esparza moment, and he knows it. Esparza yeah. moment. Yeah. But the other thing is, they took away the 11 o'clock. The 11 o'clock number in that show had been Elaine Stretch singing yes, The Ladies well, Who Lunch. And well, since that really didn't, didn't happen work at all. as an 11 o'clock And they even robbed thing. poor Barbara Walsh. Is it Barbara Walsh? Yeah, they yeah. even robbed her of her little mm -hmm. curtain call she could have had by. The very strange, the orchestrations would have to be weird in that show, but they really are weird. And that, that song just sort of peters mm -hmm. out, and the next one begins, and it's very strange. So and you have no sense of anything but coming together. But she plays a very nice swizzle stick, don't you think? Yes, <laughs> right. 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 No, but let's face it. This is a producer's dream of a show because it's cheap. <laughs> and if they can't get an encore's production, which they did with the apple tree, they'll look for a John Doyle production. He's cheap. This is what works. Now, listen, there is a, there is a musical out there that is uh, actually fairly inexpensive to put on that all of you have liked, but that is struggling, sadly, at the box office, Spring Awakening. It needs oh. your help. Can you make the case for this I show? I cannot imagine. Ever, that, because I think it got the best reviews of, of anything, anything in year. a long time. I really love this show, mm -hmm. and and we all did, yep. mm -hmm. oddly enough. And <laughs> and when I mention it to people, they don't know what I'm talking about. Really? Well, what is it? You okay. know, I mention it to you know. I think well, maybe you know they'll ask for recommendations. I'll say, well, don't you want to see Spring Awakening? And they'll say, what? Huh. And I think possibly, what happened? What? Why? I don't know. It got lost somewhere, and maybe it's just because we're so busy screaming all the time about this and that and this and that that the volume is so loud now that the audiences don't well, that that there's too much clutter. There's so many openings this fall. I've yeah. I think it's about sex and sex oh, scares yeah. people. Oh my God! It's, it's not just about sex, but that's one major thing. And people get—I think the traditional Broadway audience is going to say, "Oh, there's sort of sexual things." Nicole sexual things. Kidman sold and, out the yeah, her entire yeah, run because she took her clothes off. Now yeah, we, we, we should just nudity. say though that this is a a, a musical ba based on the An 1891 uh, Vedican play. play about uh, teenagers coming of age sexually. Now you're a Vedican fan and yeah, expert, John. Yeah, yeah. Is it, does it do justice to Vedican? It doesn't, but it, <clears throat> but it does less injustice than it might have done. Mm. And losing all kinds of fine points of Vedekin is sort of made up for by the music, which Vedekin did not provide. Which is much richer than rent, we should say, because people oh, yes. keep com comparing oh, it yeah, to rent. And the music is, and this is, is by, far more sophisticated. And the music is by rent. Duncan Sheik, yes. we should say. Yes, yes, yes it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty good music, actually. I wish they didn't have that feel-good anthem at the end. Oh, my God, the Let the Sun Shine yes. In. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was a bit... Yeah. But, you know, I think that's, that's like interesting. The big, they oh, took okay. a big risk in this play be, by setting it still in the mid-19th century. This is very buttoned late up. 19th late 19th century. Late 19th century, but very buttoned-up Germanic environment. Well, you have to, or it wouldn't make sense. Well, yeah, but, but, but then when they start singing, the actors pull oh, out of their tight suits yeah. a microphone, and they sing these very sophisticated, wonderful songs. And you know what? You come out of the theater humming some of the songs, yes, even do, the, yeah. the anthem. And you, there's another thing about this play. You come out of the theater having been removed from your preoccupations, and you say, gee, when was the last time that happened that mm. I actually forgot my life for two hours by being at this play? I'm the wedding sorry. singer. I'm sorry no. about your no, life. No, about my life. <laughs> but what, it, what it does have is what T.S. Eliot called dissociation of sensibility. Well, well, in the, yeah. Whoa! In, in, that, in that, that's right, John. The looks are 1890s Germany. The clothes, all kinds of things. I and then when they start singing, it's all gutter sophistication of uh, 2006 uh, USA. Duncan Sheik, yes. But and no big American Idol. Pop screamers, yes, no God, screaming, no Broadway, eleven o'clock number exactly. till the very end. But you know, these really—they're not selling them like that. And, you it's know? Michael it's so Mayer. We should say it's Michael the director. Mayer. Director. His best so work is wonderful. The gay work. audiences, who <laughs> undoubtedly approve of this, I resent that the leading boy is so much prettier than the leading girl. <laughs> I'm all for it. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> I think the leading Casey. girl is lovely. <laughs> yes. I think they're all very sexy, and that's why I think they're not stars, but every one of them is very sexy. You know, they made a rock video now out of this, so I think that they're going to try to market it on, with, through MTV. With but in the, terms uh, of I heard they were you, trying to get them on, on, record, yeah. on, on playlists. And you know, we're, selling, we're talking about brands, though, again, because let's look briefly. Les Mis, Les Miserables, and a chorus line, which are delivered to us 
in solid C minus quality, you know, <laughs> good solid C minus, maybe a D plus, and people are rushing out to see them because these are known brand yeah, names, and this yeah. is what producers are yeah. looking so for. So, is it now. possible, guys, that Broadway, if, if Spring Awakening does not succeed? Is it possible that Broadway has only itself to blame because for years it's given people these big generic kind of musicals or these big family shows now and it's just essentially said to an audience of 20 year olds, 30 year olds, there's nothing here for you, don't even pay attention no, to us and we will spring waking, no one's looking. It will it's, succeed. It's not showbiz music, yeah. it's yeah. rock music and uh, the older audiences that can afford theater prices want showbiz music, they want Rodgers and Hammerstein, they don't want Duncan Sheep. Mm -hmm. I can't, I think it's a danger to underestimate the audiences because right now we have two, two new American musicals. I think Grey Gardens in itself is quite new and it's, and then we have What's become like the hottest ticket is Coast of Utopia. So you know, it was Tom Stoppard play that you, you can't get tickets for. So I and You're same lucky. thing happened with the history. <laughs> same thing happened with the History Boys, and so I think it's a danger. Right. Uh, in my, this is the cheerleading side. To uh, <laughs> under, <laughs> underestimate. Please has, don't compare the History Boys. The, 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 the side, side over there. Please don't compare the History Boys to that. To that, Spring Awakening? To, no. <laughs> Coast of Utopia. To Coast of Utopia. And they're not the same thing, that but what they are is they, annoying. Oh, please, oh, please. Boring. Oh, please, oh, please. Stupid oh, please, play. Oh, please, oh, please. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's talk about it. What I was saying <laughs> is that track, I believe that this is going to take a little time to catch on because people somehow, the word is not out on it. Mm -hmm. But when the word is out on it, it will catch on. Yeah, but, well, let us hope so. But it's yeah. got a, a harder thing to because the the uh, Stoppard plays in a nonprofit theater, so they don't have to make a profit. Yeah, sure, yeah. the tickets are sold out, and it's well. Also, you got to remember though, with Lincoln Center, they have a very large subscription base yes, to begin with, so there aren't doesn't that matter. many tickets. Their balance sheet doesn't matter if it doesn't match up. But this is real producers trying to put on something fresh and original. Spring Awakening. And they're having a struggle, yeah. more of a struggle than Annie at, <laughs> at that horrible Madison, Madison Square Garden Ooh. Theater. It is Annie is an outrage, and yet <laughs> I'm told it's every seat is sold out. No one's apologizing for it. Chorus doing very well. Yeah. Uh, only because only Sandy looks embarrassed. Have you seen this? This I'm uh, seeing it tonight. Oh, no, only actually, Sandy life, life looks is, embarrassed. Life is too short. <laughs> but <laughs> everybody Linda. else is perfectly happy because the show is making. Millions! It's it's very successful. Everybody say, "Well, it's Annie. Go see Annie." With Kathy Spring Lee Awakening. Gifford. This is <laughs> the Kathy problem. They, it's a new name. It's something they haven't heard of. For one hundred and eleven dollars, they're nervous. And then you tell them it's about sex and it's rock and roll. Where's they just the they're marketing? Have they to, have to market to, 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 to They're gonna have to get rid of that pretty girl in Spring Awakening. Put Kathy Lee Gifford in there. John. That's, <laughs> it, that's, that's it. That's it. Now, or they uh, should make it a trilogy, like uh, the Stoppard. Like right, well, now, let's talk about the Stoppard, the Coast yeah. of Utopia, um, a play set in um, uh, pre-revolutionary uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, John, were you reading your uh, 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 Russian philosophers in the Cradle as well? No, I haven't read them even before Stoppard got hold of them. Do you have to know? about this period yeah. of history to understand this It play. helps. It helps a lot if you do. Um, well, it's, how should I say, Stoppard is always clever, but cleverness alone isn't enough. And his topic here does not resonate with most audiences, which is not really his fault. I mean, I imagine in England more people know European history than do people in America know European history. So it does sort of fall on deaf ears in some ways. And some of it, I think, is uh, self-serving and show-offy, Stoppardian. I say the fellow is too clever by three quarters. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, there is something there, and well, I've gotten to be grateful for that. Linda, um, you, like, you love this play. I s well, I actually, it's not my very favorite Stoppard play, but um, I did see the whole marathon in London mm -hmm. four in years ago. Day. In one day. Yes, well, they you, presented right? them all together. They didn't yeah. roll them out the way they are here, yeah. and I didn't. I I think this production is 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 much better. Directed by Jack O'Brien. Jack O'Brien's yeah. production is infinitely better than Trevor Nunn's production was, and also, the, I had the sense, that they had very quickly put it on as he 
he had done research for seven years or whatever. And I, it was the first time I had felt that Stoppard had more fun doing the research than he had doing the digesting and the processing and the writing of it. Mm. Good and point. That's, that's good point. really how I felt in London. Mm -hmm. And so I was really pleasantly surprised by this absolutely gorgeous production at Lincoln Center. That first act is unbearable to me, the first hour and a half. But I, I've seen the whole thing. So then it clicks in and you're so off and running. So trust me that that first hour and a half, when you see it in a whole day, it's really your prologue. Ah, and I instead, see, this right. was like masterpiece theater on, you know, intellectual <laughs> steroids or something. It was well, like you know, it was is, like a parody of name dropping. Exactly. Stoppard is an autodidact, which is the worst kind of didact there is. <laughs> and, I think and, so. You know, I, I loved Russian civilization. I studied a whole year of Russian civilization and I had a whole syllabus in on Herzl. In, in the cradle while you were reading Proust, I was reading the Russians. I did not come at this from an ignorant point of view but it struck me that he took a fascinating, this is a fascinating period and just dumped it on stage, just there's, dumped it. Uh, now as nothing, it's true that there there is there's some nice staging by Jack O'Brien. There's a wonderful ice sculpture of the the domes you can look at while you're nodding off at the at the blather on <laughs> and it's just dump, dump, dump. And he has no there's no there's no sense of weaving. Now there may be in the second and third act. Yeah, really, really But why does it have to be basket. nine hours except that he's a well, show it off? It's eight and a quarter now. Oh, right. oh wow. Well. <laughs> He's always trying to what's, intimidate what's the audience. With, what's wrong with autodidacts? All that means to me is a didact with wheels. That's an autodidact. <laughs> oh, John Simon Churchill. Well, boy, oh, <laughs> the, 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 don't encourage him. Maybe five as a critic, but number one as a punster. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, now there's a play that I am particularly fond of that uh, Susan isn't so crazy about. Uh, David Hare's <laughs> The Vertical Hour, which has a terrific performance by, uh, by, by Bill, Bill Nye. Nye. I think. Uh, <laughs> Linda, I uh, uh, all right, what's wrong? What's wrong with the vertical hour? And well, Bill Nye, if you don't like him. Well, right. Bill Nye, I think, is fascinating to watch. I think a little overdone, perhaps. But what else can he do? But he has you know, ticks. and it, they are wonderful ticks. He is, yeah. But no, I thought that was the Get only thing to off. watch in it. I really like David Hare. I have, mm. you know, loved many of the female characters, particularly that is written. You know the the the, woman, the female characters in Plenty. Yeah. Plenty in, was the best. It was was really wonderful. And so, I had expected a um, complicated character that, uh, and also because Julianne Moore is an in, such an interesting actress, film, film, film actress. actress. And I thought she basically knew her lines, and she had no character at all. And I thought that the the that Hare was more confused about what he wanted. And what to is do he, here? What is he trying to say in this play? Do you think? Well, yeah, what is this play the, about? For, what is it about? I, somewhere in there, it's about that you can't split the personal and the political. I think uh, Julianne Moore's character <laughs> yeah. is sort of false. It's a falsely constructed. Totally. Totally. She, she, she's, she's a, a she's journalist. A, a journalist who's now teaching Christian at a university. Christian Amalpour's sort of journalist, yeah. very. But, but, but she who supports who is, the who's Iraq pro war. war, which is ludicrous. Yeah. And and the best speeches in the play are Bill Nye's speeches to her, these interrogatories, yeah. which yeah. are right out of plenty in a way, you know, those marvelous thundering phrases that he yeah, has. Yeah, but the female character but sounded she, like like an Englishman was exactly, writing about her. Exactly. You know? And yes, exactly, yeah. sort of a, at a distance. Yeah, uh, yeah. Of, well, of, she didn't of sound like the, any of the thoughts. Uh, of and her words were coming from her mind. Or that no. she had actually ever seen anything die. Right. You know, exactly. much less. So Bill and I was up there alone. So yeah. The young man yeah. was good. The yeah, he was good. Was good. Yeah. Uh, but I, I thought this was like two, if not three plays in one. Yeah. There was the very interesting play that began about Iraq. Then we went into this play about how the middle-aged man can get his son's girlfriend if he Which wants is kind her of a play. Snooze, Which I a found a how total about, snooze. How about Freud and what's happening oh, yeah. underneath? Yeah. Yeah, if they get underneath, underneath one, one more time. time. Yeah, yeah, having he, read he was, Freud in the cradle myself, yeah. I thought that was the most fascinating <laughs> part about the play. But it was too, too many plays in one it. for me. Yeah. What? yeah. Too, too, many too many plays at once. No, I, I, absolutely. And none of them interesting enough. But how many playwrights make us think? Make made us think much much more than Stoppard in the, that Russian sure, play. Sure. This is really, this engages the mind and you come out really feeling sort of yeah. like your brain I is... Think that, I think that can when be you... said for her. He always makes you think. Yes. And that's a good thing, let's face mm -hmm. it. Yeah. We're done. We're done, that's it. But um, I want to thank 
Jacques Lesourd from Gannett Newspapers, Linda Weiner from Newsday, John Simon from BloombergNews.com. All, <laughs> He's so all number ones in our book here on <laughs> Theater Talk. Thank you guys for a lively and uh, enjoyable discussion. So let's close with a little bit of Spring Awakening. God, I dreamed there was an angel who could hear me through the wall As I cried out like in Latin, this is so not life at all Help me out, out of this nightmare, then I heard her silver call She said, just give it time, kid, I come to one and all She said, give me that hand, please, and the itch you can't control Let me teach you